welcome. Thank what do you what do you think of uh, each other's comments or the even overall the conference and how you've connected up with uh, some of the other themes? Well, I think your your comment that you had to me uh, is one of the the big takeaways is the value add. If I had to say one thing from the conference that, to make us think, it is being clear about what's the value that we add. And if we can't articulate the value that we add to policymakers, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to get the resources. I think it's happening in education across the board. And so I think that's, that's the message, is how do we articulate the value add, and then how do we get policymakers to really you know, begin to accept, uh, to begin to accept the data. I think that's the takeaway for me from this. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, and I guess what I want to say too is, there's enough data out there to make that case. Uh, one of the first studies I did in Missouri, uh, we had um, a sample. We used this is all state data, so I had nothing to do. We just analyzed it. Uh, it was collected, but we had uh, 20 about 22,000 high school students across over 200 Missouri high schools and found that when you more fully implement a comprehensive program, the first thing you find is that students will say there's more college and career information that's being, that's a very, that immediately goes up. So uh, as a uh, assistant professor at the time and, or no, I think I was tenured at that, but I still was like, well, great, I was going to uh, run down and talk with uh, our Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, and, and they looked at me like um, I was from Mars, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and actually the one person said, well, you know, the Commissioner of Education, a parent got in, in his, uh, in front of him and said that they had the terrible counselor and, uh, and that message about fitting into the stereotypes about what went on overrid the, da the data. So I think the first thing is to gather up the things that we've, we find are credible um, and I'd be the first one to uh, critique the research we've done, its strengths and its weaknesses. But it's, it's certainly, cr there's credible work out there uh, in Europe as well. Um, there's a lot of very good work that's been done in other parts of the world as well. And to, and to take a look at that and to bring that together. Uh, and so I think it's how we craft our message. And then the efficacy part to be persistent and to, uh, because this is not an arena we're used to uh, uh, being effective in. So uh, last year we had a day on the Hill where we actually went and talked to our legislators uh, of the Massachusetts School Counselors Association. That was a pretty, um, for me, pretty intimidating. I, I had never done that before. Um, but I think it's the kind of thing we're gonna need to do if, if in fact uh, we're gonna make changes in, in this area. And, and it just seems interesting, the, the access conversation mm -hmm and the quality of the services being provided conversation go hand in hand. Yes. yes. I mean, especially the, the part uh, that you raised about the having more counselors in a more of a high risk mm -hmm. school has an even greater impact. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the one size fits all, but it's really trying to figure out, you know, where do we need to put our resources? If we were a business, you know, we'd be saying, where do we invest our capital resources and our human resources? to get the most impact. Well, why can't we do that in our field? Where do we really need to invest the resources? And part of it is, you know, we really need to invest wisely. And I think our profession has a little bit been governed by tradition. You know, this is the way things, things happen. You know, this is how this works. This is how we do this. And I think the, the handwriting's on the wall that we really need to look beyond the way we have done things. Um, uh, and just to, to be a little um, uh, blunt about it, um, you know, is our moral responsibility as counselors to have a nice job, to do activities that we enjoy? In other words, I've, I've picked this field because I like sitting down and talking with people. And so I, I want to have a job I like. Mm -hmm. But isn't it a responsibility that we have is to meet the needs of the people who are out there? Even if I really enjoy sitting down and talking one-on-one -on -one with a person, I may like that. But if it means that there's a whole bunch of kids out there that could have been helped but aren't, just because it's not something I enjoy. I don't enjoy doing group interventions or I don't, I don't enjoy these brief interactions. I don't enjoy developing instructional resources that kids can use. Well, maybe our responsibility is to go beyond what we enjoy doing in our work and maybe trying to figure out what's the best way to use our time. Yeah. I, I, I would agree. Uh, uh, pushing ourselves out of our comfort uh, zone. So one of the projects I'm currently working on now is developing uh, language arts 
uh, college readiness curriculum for seventh graders that could be seamlessly integrated into um, uh, the curriculum. So for all seventh graders, so you could bring it to scale. So the counselors would be coming into the classrooms, the um, the teachers, and it would be fully. And the work that they would be doing would also then they'd be producing products. So there'd be a gr very good likelihood that the multi-paragraph essays they have to write when they get to our state exams, those scores will go up. We've seen some evidence, uh, you know, of that. However, well, one of the things I realized was, um, uh, in, it was kind of a, um, uh, had to uh, uh, take stock of was that when it came to writing cl curriculum, quite honestly, I was like god awful uh, at it. Uh, I mean, that was not a strength. Uh, and I was fortunate uh, working with uh, my sister, uh, who's a, uh, in, a middle school language arts teacher, and my wife Sharon, who's special ed in art and tutoring. And so, and so it's like working, learning from them about how to begin to put something together. So getting out of our comfort zone, so that we develop those kind of uh, interventions that have a likelihood of increasing access, as you're saying. But there, I don't think there's any difference between what you're talking about at the college university level and what I'm talking about at the elementary, middle, that's or high school right. level. There, there was a, this should be a seamless kind of system, and that's what I tried to get after in that my, the book, uh, the K through 16, you know, kind of get people thinking about this, how we, the curriculum should be spiraled and connected across that way. And so, um, and we know that, and from the research we know about, uh, you know, something about um, the match between your interests and college majors by a high school senior has something to do with um, GPA in college, doesn't it? Don't, yeah. Just a thought on that too, um, at the college level, uh, Dennis Nord out at UC Santa Barbara, the English classes as a freshman would use the Career Center to gather the data to write their papers and writing about a particular yeah. career. And so mm -hmm. this idea that we can have a huge impact at the K-12 level linking to these common core standards, right. um, math as well, the application of math is labor market information. It's, right. it's the investigative skills and science skills of hypothesis testing and doing something. We can, we can link our curriculum to that, but I think at the college level we can help support um, some of our other academic areas, and by doing that, getting more access and helping students see the value of our services. Mm -hmm. And also moving out of these one-stop centers, I think that's been one area where vocational psychology and counseling psychologists haven't had as great an impact in the one-stop mm -hmm. movement. I don't think our voice is heard as well there. Um, and we're talking about literally serving millions and millions of individuals. Yeah. Well, part of it means we need to de design interventions that are briefer, that can serve larger volumes of individuals. That's right. We had Ryan Duffy from our society talking about going to the one stops, wanting to be part of that, and they're just not seeing any role um, for him in that, that, that there just isn't the sense of what value we're bringing to them. And I wonder if part of that is because they're so focused on placement, and that's where their pressure is, and the concept of career development isn't really part of their training or their lexicon. Well, we need to understand the kind of forces that they're under and the fact that from a policy perspective, they are paid by their number of placements, which is not a particularly good model. It really has limitations. But uh, vocational psychologists have enormous capacity to make an intervention, one by the design of the, re the in assessment and information resources and how we can put those on the web and how we can support people with telephone counseling, for example, uh, to do brief interventions to help people use those resources. If that's not what Frank Parsons really started and in the spirit of what he was doing here in Boston, um, I really don't know what is. It's just that we're not connecting our skill set, the kind of things that we can do, because we don't, we haven't reached out to the, to the, especially the employment sector, and to really learn about what their needs are, what their issues are. So when we talk to them, we're not speaking in a way that fits their particular language. I mean, one, one uh, criticism I have of vocational psychology is that if you look at the literature, if you just do a content analysis of our major journals um, and look at the number of times that the word employment is used, it's, um, Janet Lenz and I did a, a quick survey of that back a few years ago and found there was really little attention amongst career theorists related to employment. Yeah. And I think that's the key is, is if we can start using the word career and workforce development as kind of what we're looking at. It links us at both the, the kindergarten students that are getting the social skills and the emotional learning needed to prepare themselves all the way up through adulthood. Yeah. If we really want to be players at this point in time, uh, we have got to be able to look at you know what, what are the basic needs that exist. And right now, if they're young people, it's to stay in school 
um, and to gain uh, education and skills that they need so that they can become employable. If we don't, if we don't face the E word, ultimately, mm -hmm. right. we're, we're going to be marginalized as a, uh, as a profession. Mm -hmm. Rich, any last comments? I, I was, I was going to say, and then David would have a question. But you know, the, the um, interesting, I was re looking at the uh, Evans and Burke meta analysis back in the early 90s on the career education programs, and kind of the point you made, Scott, about they were saying that they're, they're more effective if you link up with the language, arts, and math curriculum, if you, if you put those in there. And actually, the strongest effects were at the elementary level with achievement. I know. I know. David, I need you on a mic. David, David, I need you. David, no, I need you on a microphone. Yeah, that's what I was asking. They need to beam you out. It's just that, the, you know, there is a National Employment Counselors Association. It's a small group in ACA. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I don't know the politics of ACA very well at all, but um, you know, I think NCDA, SBP should pair up with them. I mean, they've had a journal out for years, right. Journal of Employment Counseling. Right. So they've, they've been involved with the one stops. It's saying that, I think that's the, one of the problems. I think you're right on target. And the, the issue for me is it's a small little group. Um, and how do we begin to link up so we form these strong partnerships across all the groups so we really are one larger force going at this? Well, with that, why don't we um, transition into the town hall meeting? I got a couple more minutes on break and, and get started, and uh, Kimberly Howard will lead that, and we'll get some notes taken from that. So, thank you very much for uh, the oh, time. You're welcome. All right.